Hello and welcome. Welcome to a special uh, day before Thanksgiving uh, edition of Fearless with Jason Whitlock. Uh, I'm not going to waste a bunch of time uh, promoing our next guest. I hope that many of you guys heard him last Friday uh, when he made his debut on Fearless. Maybe the smartest athlete I've ever spoken to. Uh, we're going to dive in deeper with Royce White, who was a basketball star at Iowa State, 16th pick of the NBA draft maybe a decade ago. Uh, mental health issues uh, derailed his career. He's now an activist and one of the most out, outspoken activists. Uh, brilliant mind, and so I just want to delve in deeper with Royce White and just get a better broader understanding of who Royce is and, and how he came about his worldview and his ability to articulate his worldview in such a clever manner. I, I read a piece this weekend where Royce is a uh, mentee, I think would be the proper description, of Steve Bannon, uh, the guy who helped Trump get in the office, the guy that our Department of Justice is trying to go after. Uh, so I, 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 I want to start a little bit before Steve Bannon, though, but I definitely want to talk about your relationship with Steve Royce. But I, I'd like to go back to your upbringing and your parents. If you could just walk us through your childhood and were you always a really thoughtful athlete or was there some sort of transition pivot point in your life? Well, thanks for having me again, Jason. I really appreciate it. <clears throat> I just want to say thank you to your audience first before we get started. The Fearless Army, man, they've, they've given me nothing but positive feedback over the last few days since our uh, portion of an interview aired. And, uh, you know, I, I can't say enough about how important it is for people like you uh, to give people like me a platform to, to continue to talk about these issues in a meaningful way, um, because we know there's a, a strong force out there that wants to keep certain individuals from having any spotlight or, or platform whatsoever. Um, and, and before we get started, if I can, just for a minute or so, I'd like to address something that I think will help frame the conversation properly. And then and then you can go ahead and, and we can circle back to, to early childhood and, and the upbringing piece. Um, I, th I think this is very important. Uh, and you even alluded to it a little bit in your introduction. <clears throat> and it's a story that's been told over and over again. Uh, and, and different variations, but with the same central theme. Um, I, I never quit the NBA, okay? I was blackballed. Actually, I still am being blackballed, and it has very little to do with my anxiety or any fear of flying. Uh, that was propaganda. It was a scapegoat used to avoid, used by the establishment to avoid having a very important conversation about mental health and subsequently mental health policy. Um, you know, I always have been able to fly. I fly to this day. I flew during our last big three seasons, not not this past one where we were mainly located in, in Las Vegas. Um, but when we did play in, in Dallas and when we did play back in the Midwest, I did fly uh, to those events as well. So I always have been able to fly uh, and, and I still can to this day. Um, you know, eight years ago, when my situation was taking place with the NBA, the very small percentage of people in the NBA, pro sports, or the media that would even acknowledge mental health wanted to discuss mental illness with a very narrow view. I wanted to expand that view. And like I said to you the last time we spoke, I think it is, I think it is the proper view uh, that mental health is a, another way to say the human condition where the mind, body, and spirit converge into our perceivable existence. Um, they wanted to talk about mental illness uh, as many people do, those crazy people and their problems, right? And, and if they were able to frame uh, this widespread crisis in, in such a narrow manner, then it justified their inaction, right? If they were able to, to frame this widespread crisis um, uh, in, 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 such a, in such a minuscule way, in such a narrowed way, uh, then it's easy for them to say, hey, this one kid, this one kid right here uh, has this unique issue. And 
he wants us to change our entire league, our entire, our entire business, our entire policy for him. He's a diva. He's a prima donna, right? And, and that's kind of the ethos of, of how they wanted to go about discussing the mental illness topic or mental health. And I wasn't going to allow it because there's too much at stake. Mm. Since you went there, I got to ask a follow up. Do you regret the way you handled that in terms, because I'm sure that came at a great financial consequence. I mean, mm -hmm. there was a lot of money you could have made in the NBA. Do you regret the way you handled that? I, I regret that I didn't go harder. You know, because, and, and, and I'll say, th this is why this matters, okay? I hear a lot of people saying, Keep the politics out of sports. Keep the social issues out of sports. Well, that's a non-starter because the politics are never off. And sports is politics. Professional sports represents a global corporate culture. It's the, glo it's the watering hole for a global corporate community. And, and because of that, how they feel, how it feels about the human condition is paramount because we live under a global corporatocracy. And, and that's and, and that's why the the question is is tough to answer because yes you know th there there is a way I could have went about it that was dishonest that that looked out for my own best interests first but seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be added unto you and I think the rise of atheism the rise of this pagan uh, Judeo Buddhist neoliberal movement is is greatly to blame for how wayward society has become. So, you know, if anything, as I look back, I, I, I fight the urge to say, well, I should have went for mine first and, and I, I should have doubled down because in the beginning I was trying to. I was trying to give the NBA an opportunity to meet me in the middle and become the spearhead for this global epidemic and that's what the mental health crisis is it's a global epidemic and it's at the heart of all of these issues see because at, at bottom mental health is a philosophical question it is a question of of uh, of the existential whether people like it or not and this is what i mean about sports is you don't get to separate the sports from life you know that that's just corrupt right mental health is a philosophical question and anxiety is a philosophical question Right. People think of anxiety as anxiety disorders. And yes, I live with it. But angst, anxiety is a symptom of angst. And angst is uh, uh, is emerging. Right. Meaning that it's, it's always reemerging for human for humans, because we're aware of our own vulnerability. We're aware of th that our time on this planet and in this life is is limited. And, and because of that, it creates anxiety for all of us. And rightfully so. But angst is the root cause of anxiety, which makes it a philosophical question. And let's take me out of it for a second, right? Let's take whether or not my career could have flourished, which we know it could have. My game is the prototypical game uh, in, in the modern NBA uh, as being a versatile uh, three, four man who can handle the ball, who's a willing passer, who's uh, gritty and tenacious on defense and, and really competes and cares about the game is going to go out and fight night in and night out on behalf of his teammates, the city, and just a general love of the game. I'm the, I'm the, I'm where the game has moved to. And that's why I say I'm still being blackballed by the way, because I'm, I'm not even in my prime yet. I'm 30 years old, but I've played three seasons since I was 18. I could be playing right now, but <clears throat> he, here's, let's take me out of it for a second. Why was it that Daryl Morey was so anxious about losing his position in the NBA that he immediately apologized for his comments about Hong Kong, even though he knew he was right morally? And so in that example, we can see where anxiety, mental health, the human condition become a question of philosophy, become a question of the existential and have a huge impact on the moral. So if I could go back right now to the beginning, I would double down. Let me go back to where I started at the beginning because I just want to know a little bit more about you. What city did you grow up in? Your parents, what role did they play? You grew up in yeah. the church. 
Were you really heavy into sports and dabbled in academics, or were you heavy into both? Fill us in about Royce White from age one to 19. Huh. Um, you know, I grew up here in the Twin Cities to a blue collar community. Um, several generations on either side. Uh, on, on, my mo on my mother's father's side, his mother was a first generation immigrant, immigrant from Mexico. Uh, and, and his father was black. People had come from Kentucky and Arkansas. Um, and my, my mother's mother's side, her father was black. People had come from Arkansas. Um, and, and her mother was a first generation immigrant from Norway. Um, so, you know, very rich immigrant blood uh, in, in my family tree. And the people in, in, in those extended families were natural born leaders. My grandfather uh, was the honorary consulate to Mexico. Uh, and, and, you know, it, my grandmother helped build Our Lady of Guadalupe, which is a Catholic church on our, our west side here in our capital city, St. Paul, where uh, we have a very uh, old and, and strong Mexican community. Uh, and she was a matriarch in that community. When she died, her funeral had thousands of people attending it because she helped build the church. And her and, and her husband helped people settle here from Mexico, uh, at, you know, when they when they uh, immigrated to this country. Um, and, and on the other side, you know, my Norwegian family, my great uncle Alfred Auri was and still is regarded as one of the most uh, influential dental scientists in the history of our of our country. You know, the way dental scientists taught today uh, being as a part of a, a holistic approach to medicine and being taught in the med school in a four-year curriculum is greatly due to his his work and his advocacy that it be taught that way. Um, and, and he, you know, advocated for universal health care and proper nutrition in the in the early 1900s, 1920, 1930. He was the dean of the dentistry, dentistry school at the University of Minnesota and, and eventually Columbia. Uh, and so, you know, th there's just leaders in, in my family, in my family history. And I grew, grew up knowing about them. I grew up influenced by their daughters and sons and nieces and nephews. Um, but I come from a blue collar family for the most part. And, and my mother was a single mother. Um, her and my father weren't together when I was growing up, but I knew my father. Uh, we had a relationship. He just didn't live with us. And, and I had a bunch of males in the community that, that always encouraged me to think for myself and to stand on the things that I believe in and, and, and encourage me to have a, a good uh, moral, you know, moral foundation. As a kid growing up, were, how early did the dream of being a basketball player at the college or NBA level, when did that first become important to you? Well, I, I mean, I grew up in the 90s, right? So. I mean, I grew up in the, the, the golden era of the Chicago Bulls and, and I lived in the Twin Cities. So, you know, our local channel here, WGN, covered the Chicago Bulls almost every night. I mean, most television was covering the Bulls almost every night at the time. But but we got all the games that weren't even nationally televised because Minneapolis is a stone's throw from Chicago. Um, so I grew up watching the Bulls and, and um, you know, I, I idolized Michael Jordan. I idolized uh, the Bulls as a team. And uh, towards the end of his career, uh, ushered in, uh, you know, Kevin Garnett. And, and then that became my idol uh, from a basketball standpoint. And, you know, I'd say, you know, I started playing basketball at five years old, right? And, and every, every kid's dream is to eventually be able to play in the NBA. And I would say there was a good chunk of time in my childhood where I didn't necessarily think I was going to be good enough to play in the NBA. Um, it probably clicked for me around junior high where I started to realize I was uh, better than some of the other players. I had a chance to play in some national type of tournaments and, and compare my talent and skill against what people thought were the best at the time around the country. And I was able to hold my own and, and have some success. So I think at that time it started to register that I had an opportunity uh, to become a pro athlete if I continued to work hard. And, and, I, and I did just that. You know, I started doing a 500 to 1,000 push-ups every night when I was in the seventh or eighth grade, and, and I still do it to this day religiously. And, and that's just the mentality that I bring um, to, to being an athlete, and it, it paid off. By the time I had got to Iowa State, I had to sit two years. I transferred from the University of Minnesota. 
Um, and then I was denied a waiver, a transfer waiver to play my first year at Iowa State, which would have been Fred Hoiberg's first year coaching. Um, and then his second year coaching, I was able to play and, and we uh, we shocked a lot of people. We were picked to finish last or second to last in the Big 12. We end up tying for second. Um, and, and we beat every team that, that was ahead of us. We split with Kansas. I think Baylor may have finished in front of us. Uh, we split with Baylor. Uh, and, and I had a pretty good showing in the the NCAA tournament against a bunch of high-level draft picks. Anthony Davis, Andre Drummond, the other guys who were going to be drafted there in, on the Kentucky team and, and also on that UConn team. So, When did it become apparent to you that you were going to be more than an athlete and wanted to be have a voice in the political world? I think I've always had that in mind. Um, the one thing about how I grew up and that I'll credit my mother for, uh, you know, she, she was a single mother. She worked a lot. There were nights where I didn't see her until, you know, 6.30, 7 o'clock. <clears throat> She kept a great deal of books in my room, um, and and they weren't children's books. Let's say that um, they they were heavy, and I read them, um, and I enjoyed reading them, and I enjoyed reading them, and then I enjoyed thinking about what it was they were trying to convey and putting it in the context of what I was experiencing out in the world, what I was seeing, and not what I was seeing on TV, what I was seeing in my everyday life. And uh, when I was diagnosed with anxiety at 16 years old, it really changed my life because at that time I was forced to dive into an issue that I really didn't know a whole lot about, even though I was well read. Um, mental health was one of those issues that had just flown under the radar. And, um, you know, once I had to dive into that issue for my own health, for my own sake, uh, to, to maintain my own anxiety and, and try and stay healthy. Um, it, it unlocked a whole new world for me. And I, and I really started to understand uh, the, the, the underbelly of, of, of our problems in society. And, and like I said before, it is a mental health problem, but it's also a philosophical one, right? So I think the anxiety diagnosis was a real turning point for me. How did you get connected to Steve Bannon and what role does he play in your political, cultural activism and just worldview and outlook on America and, and the world? So I first uh, was introduced to Steve Bannon by one of my good friends, my best friend, actually. Uh, we had these all out political debates, you know, between he and I some nights for hours, right? And, and we're just we're just trying to sharpen the ideas. We invite the the uh, the confrontation of ideas, and and being able to go back and forth and figure out which ones hold up as they are poked and prodded. And uh, one day I was I was just sitting around, you know, uh, with, with the family, and he sent me an interview. And the interview was of Steve Bannon uh, with PBS Frontline. It was entitled. Um, Zero Tolerance, and it was a part of the, the Great Divide series. And, um, you know, I watched the entire thing. It's about two hours long. I invite anybody who has preconceived notions about Donald Trump, the Donald Trump movement, the populist movement, or Steve Bannon to go watch that interview. And as I watched it, I realized this was just, this was just about, you know, two years ago, I'd say. Uh, maybe three now. It was probably a year before the pandemic hit. Um, or six months before the pandemic hit, uh, I realized that what I had faced as a 21-year-old with the mainstream media corrupting narratives, using yellow journalism, and, and um, using people and using topics as a, as a means to manipulate uh, was exactly what had gone on with, with how Steve Bannon had been represented in the public as a white supremacist, as a white nationalist, as a racist, uh, and any other uh, in any other you know demeaning characterization that they that they try to use against him, and I just sat there and I really listened to what it was he was actually saying, and and the takeaway was was strong in favor of him, and in, in that he's somebody who people need to be listening to, and and I can say that with with all humility and and one hundred percent confidence, and you know we got introduced because Steve Bannon actually used to work for 
Jeff Quatnitz, who was the partner of Ice Cube in the Big Three League. And, uh, you know, Jeff and I were just talking politics one day. He's another brilliant mind, another brilliant poli uh, political mind, and somebody who's very active, pretty progressive and liberal, uh, you know, by by most standards. Uh, but Steve Bannon had worked for him. So we were talking politics, and, and I, I had brought up Steve Bannon, and he, he just mentioned, like, hey, you know, Steve used to work for me. I know Steve well. Uh, and, and he made the introduction, and, and from there, me and Steve have, have started to create a, a really uh, strong relationship. I, I, it's, it's somewhat of a silly question because I'm to the point now that anybody the media paints as racist, I tend to go the other, well, well that person must not be racist. I, I'm, I'm literally almost to that point. Uh, but if you could, in, if you were talking directly to black people, Tell them what you think of Steve Bannon and what lies have been told or what do you know about him that refutes the narrative that the media has painted about him? I think that the mainstream media has played a color game of three card Monty, a three card Monty color race game. Uh, between black and white while they make off with the green. And, and that's not to say that racism doesn't exist. I'm not of the Candace Owens, uh, Candace Owens thought or even your, your Larry Elders that, that want to go around and say uh, racism is not an issue in this country, because that's absurd. And, and actually what they should be saying is neoliberal racism is more profound than right wing white supremacy. And, and that's why Larry Elder, you know, had a, a white woman show up to a you know, one of his uh, rallies or one of his appearances and throw an egg at him in a gorilla mask. He couldn't even say that was racist because he's built a brand where he's saying that racism isn't an issue. So I, I, I'm not of that school of thought, but I do understand that it's become a, it's become a surefire way to silence or discredit anybody who opposes the status quo, who opposes the neoliberal agenda which is also a globalist and, and anti-human agenda. And, and uh, Steve Bannon is one of those people. And, and I recognized it because it's kind of the same way that mental health is used or weaponized. And, and uh, you, it's, it's weaponized, the stigma of it is weaponized to say anybody who says something that's a little against the status quo is crazy, right? The crazy, um, you know, discrediting, is, is also ref is similar to the, the white supremacy and racist one. So, you know, when I watched the interview with Steve Bannon, Zero Tolerance, I heard him talk about economic nationalism. I heard him paint a picture of the geopolitical circumstance of our society, who the power players are, what their interest is, and how they've manipulated not only people, but the narrative uh, to maintain, maintain the status quo. Which is which is really a, a neo feudalist system here in America, um, but it, but it's an elitist system around the world. And um, you know, I just it's it's hard for you to convince me that a man who is saying that we need to bring manufacturing back home to America so that those jobs can go to working class Hispanics and blacks is racist. That that puzzles me. It's the same way it's hard for me to understand why they're saying Kyle Rittenhouse shooting three white people is white supremacy, you know, or, or is racist. I, I just, you know, you can run that stuff on a fool. And part of the, and, and here's the greatest trick that the establishment has played on people. They've undermined the importance of philosophical currency Right. They, they've almost made it where as to where and I saw this in some of the feedback. Well, you say too many big words or, you, you know, you talk too verbose or dumb it down a little bit. They want you to be dumb. They want you to be conditioned in illiteracy. They want you to, to think short and fast, you know, short and quick and fast. They want you to not be able to digest. They 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 don't want the contemplative at the center of our society. Right. Because if it is, then people are going to actually take their time to think through. What's going on in my life? 
what are the institutions that that preside over me? Who runs them? And if you do that far enough, you'll end up, you know, at the proper at the proper villains, and then you'll and then you'll be able to identify the proper heroes. And I think Steve Bannon is is a hero, because like I said, there, there's this whole race game that's being yes, racism is an issue. Um, but Fred Hampton would say, and, and actually Fred Hampton was killed and assassinated, not after he, you know, first joined the Black Panther movement or after he went out and advocated for black people or pushed against a racist system. And, and there was a racist system back then, but they killed him after he formed the Rainbow Coalition between working class Latinos, whites and blacks, because he saw that there was an economic game that was that was tyrannical against the working class against common people. And as soon as he turned his attention to that, bang, assassinated. Right. And it's the same thing with Malcolm X. Oh. Before Malcolm, before oh. Malcolm X was in Islam, right? As soon as he went to black nationalism, bang, he was done. As soon as he went on a worldwide uh, 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 pilgrimage, and, and, and was a threat to bring the Islamic world together, or, uh, you know, a, a global Islamic world together or closer together, that's when he became the real threat. So sometimes uh, the threat that they put in front of you isn't the real threat. And that's what we see with the mainstream media. That's what we see with the race, the race baiting game that's played. And Steve Bannon is right in the crosshairs right now. And so is Donald Trump. I, I don't want to waste time. We can debate Fred Hampton at another time. I do want to just suggest to you as it relates to Fred Hampton is that if you just do a body count in terms of the Chicago Black Panthers and in the six months before he was killed, just count the number of bodies the Black Panthers killed versus the number of bodies the Chicago police killed in the six months, eight months before he was killed. The Black Panthers had more dead police bodies they had more teardrops, far more, than the police had of Black Panthers. They were involved in some high-profile shootouts where the Black Panthers were using semi-automatic weapons and they were dropping bodies. And so Fred Hampton got killed because the scoreboard was out of hand. I think at one point, before he was killed, they had maybe uh, killed six police officers, injured a dozen more, and the police had maybe killed one Black Panther and injured two or three Black Panthers. And they had just had, an, he had run up a scoreboard and he got killed. But we can discuss that and debate it another, <laughs> another time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I don't like, Fred Hampton's a Marxist, an atheist, and No, but a, here's a lot, the, but and, Jason, yeah. Jason, yeah. yes, okay, here's the thing. I'm not a communist. I don't believe in Marxism. We have yeah. to use nuance to be able to pull apart which information is useful from which people. And, and this is why I, I, I'm hesitant to discount when someone is telling me the truth based on their other or overall personal beliefs. I may not agree with everything Donald Trump says, and there are many things I do disagree with him on, not enough to discount when he tells the truth. And when he says DC politics are corrupt, he's telling the truth. When he says that China is a real threat, he's telling the truth. When he says America has cut bad deals, he's telling the truth. When he says there's a culture of elitism, he's telling the truth. When he says that the ne neoliberal elites don't have black people's best interests in mind, he's telling the truth. The same thing can be said for Fred Hampton. Yes, they had a, a, an ideology in the foundations of the Black Panthers that I don't agree with politically. I don't agree with Marxism, but let's take Marxism, for example. Marxism wasn't wrong in saying that there's a, a, that in the hierarchies of society, a class system continuously emerges. The problem was with how they went about trying to deal with it. And, and it, the problem with it is, is that they didn't have a good hierarchy of values. Their highest value is something like uh, uh, identity, in which now in the modern society is diversity, equity, and inclusion. When in America and the American, uh, the, the idea of America was founded on the fact that the highest value is freedom, right? So yes, there are points of contention with Fred Hampton, but I'm certainly not gonna agree that he was killed because the scoreboard was lopsided when it comes to the Black Panthers being violent or, or being actionable 
versus the police departments. And, and there's an entire conversation that has to happen about right wing Second Amendment, armed citizens and the tyrannical state. And what does it mean to actually revolt? And what does it and what is the proper what is the proper modality of thought when it comes to our role as citizens if we accept that the system has become tyrannical? What what are we supposed to do? What's the rightful thing to do? And I think Fred Hampton and those guys had the right idea. They said, listen, the state has a monopoly on violence. At the time they were, there there was a more overt systematic racism. And and they they went about it the right way. And a lot of those Chicago police didn't like that the Black Panthers were even carrying weapons. And that's something that we have to acknowledge. The same way the federal government wouldn't like if black people started carrying weapons today out in the open, which is why the black, the, the pro-black America needs to come closer to the Second Amendment of uh, the people who are pro-Second Amendment. And let's test the system. The, the, the good way to see where racism is in this country Let's reinstitute the open carry uh, Second Amendment rifle club Black Panther movement and see how the shootouts or how that's handled by the state. That'd be a good litmus test to see where racism really is in this country. I, I think a lot of people would say that uh, based on the summer of 2020 and all the rioting, looting and violence that the system overlooked and and and. Again, I, I get they were trying to provoke Donald Trump in 2020. They wanted the state to take action against the vi the violence, the rioting, looting. That way, they can say, "Look, look at Trump. He's an authoritarian, and he's you know they want." And so he couldn't do anything, and his his hands were tied. Look, I don't want to distract the conversation because one thing I where we completely agree is but it's, but it's an important racism. One I agree with you because listen, I was out there with the neoliberals for the for the B Black Lives Matter protests. But but the reality that you have to understand is the neoliberal form of protest or motivation or animus for protest does have to do with a power game where they want to be just as tyrannical as the white supremacy they try and decry. But the state was never truly worried about a bunch of LGBTQ advocates really tilting the scales of power in a visceral way. And this is why I said that black women and the LGBTQ and, and male black sellouts too, will never be able to create a, a, a reasonable social contract between the free people and the state. It's because women aren't gonna be as violent as men. As men. So every time the state sees, uh, every time a black man is killed and grieving black women show up to negotiate on behalf of the state, the system takes a breath. They can act like they're, uh, you know, overwhelmed with 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 violence, right? Just like they did with January 6th. Oh my goodness, it's an insurrection. Let's come on. If you people think that's an insurrection, you're just soft. And and our society has become soft because that's not an insurrection, <laughs> okay? It, it, and it's the same thing with the Antifa movement. The most they're gonna do is throw a, a, a cocktail, start a fire, throw a water bottle at a cop, uh, uh, you know, a smoke bomb, a tear gas or whatever. They're not coming with, they're not coming like the, uh, you know, like the, like the one, like the three percenters, right? They're not coming like the Black Panthers were. And, and the system has a sigh of relief when that happens. So yes, I agree with you that their motivation to protest is very corrupt, but at the same time, the state's not really worried about them either for that same reason, because they don't want to really revolt. They want control of the system. I'm not prepared to rebut what you just said, because you've given me a lot to think about, and that's why I love having you on the show, because you say original things, and, and I'm a slow thinker, or I'm a content, uh, you know, I like to contemplate and reflect a little bit. The, where I was gonna say is wh where we have incredible agreement, and, and this is where I piss off the standard black person is, oh, I, I think racism is a real issue in America. I just happen to think that white people on the left are the real racists and that the, the things that they've got us to buy into, <laughs> you, know, you don't need men. And, you know, the matriarchy is going to be just as strong and as influential as the patriarchy. And, 
you know, Planned Parenthood can fix all your problems. And you know what? Uh, LGBT, same sex marriage is the same as race. all of that stuff. That's poison for black people. That, that's I call, smallpox and blankets or what, you know, same thing they gave to the Indians. They given to us and, and we're just swallowing it all. And, and I, I, I truly believe whether through good intentions, bad intentions or whatever, that left is satanic and racist, and they want black people eliminated. They want us in dysfunction and, and yep. you know, dying from what we don't know. So I, I, I certainly think racism is alive and well. Uh, it's just, it covers itself, it camouflages itself completely different than the way that it used to. Uh, instead of wearing a hood and being in the KKK, you just call yourself a liberal or a Democrat, and now no, it conceals your racism. Uh, no one, no one can see. Here's here's a good example of that. There's been a lot of talk since this pandemic started about population, about population and depopulation, and a and a name that often comes up is Bill Gates. And I try and tell people all the time, they have the wrong idea about Bill Gates. Bill Gates's view towards population and depopulation. I actually found an interview on the Gates Foundation YouTube channel where he was asked about population. And he went on to say that at the global level, population size doesn't seem to be an issue, that that population is going to peter out at about 10 billion or whatever the number was he said, and, and that it seems that we probably will be able to handle that. And then he went on to say that the real issue is the rapid growth of population in societies or in countries that can't handle it. And they showed a graphic. And in the graphic, every country that was listed was a black or brown country. And I thought to myself, bro, that's just eugenics. If you think that population growth is an issue in all African and Arab countries, <laughs> you're not a humanitarian, you're a, you're a racist. Right. And that is where the, the neoliberal elitist, globalist, anti-human racism really lives in a profound way. And it's completely corrupt that that the left won't won't point that out and won't won't cover that for the real headline that it should be. They they just tacitly approve of it. And and that's because and here here's the thing. The left is at the head of the New World Order. And people can try and talk about New World Order being conspiracy. In Australia, the, the, the government is outright saying the words, the phrase New World Order, when they're talking about COVID protocols. So you can stay asleep if you want to, but they're using the term New World Order right out in the open because they've done such a good job with, with painting it as a conspiracy that now they can say it freely. But here is the structure of the New World Order. You got big tech, and this is how it's laid out. You got big tech on top. Then you got the three industrial complexes, military, medicine, media, all underpinned by the central banks. And, and that's the Hydra. That's the New World Order Hydra right there. And, and Big Tech sits in a, in a very powerful position in that, and Bill Gates is obviously at the head of it. And those industries do very well to never allow you to know that they're in collusion, that they're in cahoots, that they're working together. But if you follow the money, if you look at $30 trillion of national debt that we've run up over 12 years and you follow the receipts, you'll see exactly who it is that we need to decry as villains. And Donald Trump's not on the list. <laughs> That's what the ironic part is. Like, you can say Donald Trump is an asshole. You can say that Donald Trump uh, isn't, the, isn't the most articulate guy. Uh, you know, and of course, President Barack Obama was a very articulate speaker. He was a, an incredible speaker. That has nothing to do with his moral position. It has nothing to do with his moral high ground. And if you follow the money, Barack Obama is at the is is one of the people at the center, right there with Bill Gates and Nancy Pelosi and the Clintons and and Mark Zuckerberg. And there's and there's a long there's a laundry list of them, and they're all right there, and they get a pass every day. And I don't understand how black people have bought into it. See, the one thing that Donald well, Trump, uh, the one thing that I'll say this that Donald Trump alluded to that I appreciate is he said America has continued to cut bad deals. And this is how the NBA and the, and the way that we've played the economic game in pro sports for black athletes is a microcosm for black America. 
okay? Black America has cut bad deals in this country. And maybe the worst deal of all is giving our vote to the Democrats for empty promises. And it's in, it's in that mode of thinking that we've allowed these people like Bill Gates to get a pass and we still vote Democrat. If you vote Democrat and you're black in, in this country, you're a fool at this point. So, yeah. I mean. You've given me a great segue to say that, you know, one of the primary salespeople to black America is someone like LeBron James, who sells the democratic agenda to black America, sells the global citizen elitist agenda. And that's what Barack Obama, I've, I've tried to explain to people in my family and like, like every, every time y'all hear the word global citizen, that should be like fingernails on a chalkboard to y'all. You ain't left your block. You haven't left your neighborhood, but, but because Barack Obama's a global citizen, you think you are? I go, and, and again, I've been around the globe and, and I've got some wealth or whatever, but my roots, my family is very working class. I've tried to explain to my mother, I go, if you go listen to Donald Trump's inauguration speech and about America first and manufacturing jobs and blah, blah, I go, mama, he's talking about you. My mother was a factory worker. My father was a factory worker and then a small business owner in the inner city that catered to factory workers. And I was like, that's what the man is actually talking about, but we're so caught up, we're such an idolatrous groupy people that someone like LeBron James, who was gifted from God with an amazing amount of talent and can play in the NBA and make millions of dollars, and, and I'm trying to explain to people like, y'all think basketball players are worshiped here in America, but in China, basketball players are really worshiped. And that's why LeBron James would be perfectly fine if America became more like China and was communist run because basketball players and ba uh, football players and other entertainers, they would be perfectly fine but the overwhelming majority of black working class people, you about to get a 12 inch rod jammed up your rear end. I mean, look, Le Le LeBron James, <laughs> and, and I wrote an entire letter to LeBron James, it ended up being a 260 page book, you know, Epistle to the King. And, and, and I go through a number of social issues with him. And, and the ninth chapter is entitled Napoleon's Prophecy, where he said, um, you know, don't wake up China, for it's a sleeping giant, and when, and when it wakes up, the world will tremble. And the world's been trembling now since the 1980s. Um, and and China, China cannot be overstated for the existential threat that it is to the free world, but to American values specifically. Um, and, and LeBron James is the prototype of the black bourgeoisie. He is the black bourgeoisie. And, and this is why I was blackballed. Am I saying that I would have been as good as LeBron James? No, I'm not going to say that. I'm saying that in a Kawhi Leonard way, I would have been able to compete with a guy like LeBron James. But I would have been all up in his in his grill every night. And I would have been in front of the media cameras after every game talking about every single issue that he won't speak to. And I would have done a great job uh, doing it. I would have been articulate doing it. I would have been able to bring the issues full circle. But as we look across pro sports, we've been conditioned to believe that the cream rises to the top, that the best, the best athletes are represented because of the professional sports leagues desire to be to win and be successful. But underneath it, there is a strong fear of any athlete, especially black athletes that can articulate the neoliberal, globalist, anti-human agenda. And that's racist too. So I can't say that racism doesn't exist because the reason I am blackballed is there's no way that I would let LeBron James walk around and talk about Black Lives Matter, Jacob Blake, or any of these other issues and avoid the Uyghurs. I mean, the Uyghurs are, the, the Uyghur genocide is the defining issue of our time. Okay, it's, it's a litmus test for our coherence on ideas of justice and freedom. 
on the ideas of justice and freedom. And it's just that simple. The Uyghur issue shows you who's willing to sell out and who's not. LeBron mm. James is a sellout. He's a sellout. It's just that simple. What do you think about what Enos Cantor is trying to do? Is he being tolerated because he's basically harmless? I, I, I would say there's, there's a lot of that. I support what he's saying. I think what he's saying is, is grounded in the right, is, you know, has the right moral position. Um, you know, I, I, in my letter to Bannon, in my letter to Congress regarding Bannon's prosecution, I go at length uh, about China. And make no mistake about it, the reason they're going after Bannon is one because he's been able to articulate the economic uh, three card Monty that the elites have played. But it's also because he's been able to articulate the threat of China and what they're doing in China. That that's why they're going after Bannon. And I laid that out completely in my letter to Congress regarding this this latest prosecution of him. Um, so so I think Enos Cantor has the right position. I think that Enos Cantor shows a real gap in his understanding of authoritarianism when he supports vaccine mandates. And I just think it's a gaping hole in his in his understanding of authoritarianism. And yes, he is harmless uh, in, in many ways. Uh, you know, he speaks broken English and, and that's not a knock on him. Right. It just is what it is. He, he speaks broken English. And, and, and he, he also he's also not a dominant character. Right. Like LeBron James was right the other night when he said, you know, if you're a man and you got something to say to me, then you're going to come up and say it. And, and Enos Cantor has gone on this you know, this this escapade about LeBron James' silence, and he's right about LeBron James' silence, uh, but he should have went up to LeBron and said something the other day. And I don't like that he didn't. And I think that it's a telltale sign that the, the mainstream media has allowed Enos Cantor to have a platform the way they have, um, you know, and, and him having that kind of disposition. Because if it was me, I would have ran up on LeBron multiple times by now. They're, they're keeping people like LeBron from me, intention. That's why I'm not in the league. There's no way you can tell me, Jason, that at 6'8", 260 pounds, I played a one, and I'm a willing passer and can defend multiple positions, that I could at least be the seventh man on somebody's roster in the modern game. There's no way, right? But they know, even as a seventh man, I'd run up on LeBron, and I'd say, oh, we could go in the back. Let's do five minutes in the locker room right now. You on behalf of Nike and Xi Jinping, and me on behalf of the free people of America, and let's see who comes out. But, you know, that's just who I am. And, and they, they, they want all people like me way away from the spotlight. I think that COVID and the vaccine mandates are creating an opportunity for people like yourself, Steve Bannon, Enos, if Enos Cantor knew what he was doing, it would create an opportunity for the other side to be heard and particularly for black people to actually hear it because I think if you go look at Antonio Brown, you look at Amari Cooper, if, if black people ain't on board with this vaccine mandate stuff. And, no. and I think it's creating an opportunity for you to be heard. Yeah, I mean, I think the vaccine mandates are pretty, they're pretty clearly tyrannical on, on three fronts. We don't have to go to the conspiracies about, you know, whether they're depopulation, uh, you know, agenda, or any of that. We can just look at three main issues. Number one, natural immunity has been ignored, okay? Number two, the there's no medical exemptions, right? And, and number three, they, they wanna vaccinate five-year-olds, <laughs> right? And, and, and so all three of those things give you a great, are a great litmus test for, for just the, you know, the legitimacy of the vaccine mandates. They're tyrannical, they're a knee-jerk reaction, um, and, and, and they're a, an opportunistic ploy on behalf of an establishment that has already shown great, you know, great tilt towards tyranny. Uh, and I think black people do have a strong intuition toward that. Uh, and, and we're right not to trust the government, right? I don't, I don't understand how, this, this, this puzzles me. I was out there in the George Floyd protest. I led the George Floyd protest in, in the city of Minneapolis. This puzzles me. I heard people say, almost religiously, F the police, the whole system is guilty. 
And I agree that a good portion of the system is guilty. But how can you turn around and trust that same system with vaccines? It's the same system. That's why I laid out the hierarchy of the new world order. The medical industrial complex is one of the three industrial complexes that, that make up the new world order structure. Media and military are the other two. So the, the medical industrial complex is the system. So if, you, if you're just gonna go out and wholesale, uh, promote and encourage people to trust the medical industrial complex, you were always a part of the system. You're a sheep or you're in on it. And, and that's pretty clear to me, right? Is the, the, no, we should not trust the medical industrial complex by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and it, the same thing goes for you know critical race theory, let's say, as another example. If the entire system is, is inherently racist and, and whites, uh, an example of white supremacy, why do you want white people teaching your kids about racism? Those are the good white people, man. <laughs> and only they which, can which they, identify. And, and that's, them. And that's racist, right? That's racist for the LGBTQIA plus to say all white people are racist except for us. Right. And, and the liberal white women, too, they go, well, I'm not racist. Well, OK, that's racist. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I wasn't planning to ask you this, but I'm wondering what your thoughts are on Daryl Brooks and what happened in. Why do I keep screwing it? Waukesha? Waukesha. Yeah, in Waukesha uh, on Sunday night. And part of me, Daryl Brooks bros up a lot of these stupid narratives of, oh my God, if, if it was a black man, they wouldn't have taken him into custody, they would have shot and killed him. Uh, and then I think the media is going to be very reluctant to acknowledge that the media has played a role in radicalizing this idiot uh, into being this filled with racial animus and hostility that he would drive his car into a group of white people and kill them. We love to say Cal Rittenhouse was radicalized and the people on January 6th, they were all radicalized by Donald Trump. Joe Biden, as a presidential candidate, called Cal Rittenhouse a white supremacist. Yeah. How is that not gassing up Daryl Brooks and others into having animus towards white people it's this constant loop of you should be mad at white people and you gotta you should do something to white people. But the media is doing this constantly, but they don't want to take responsibility for the consequences that they create. Yeah, well, I'll touch on that. I think um, well, first of all, there's nothing more radical. There's nothing more radical than thinking that a woman can have a penis or that a man can bear a child. So I think that's a that's a strong indicator of the ideology on the left, the crisis of logic and the crisis of identity. And, and subsequently, the moral crisis that we see prop up in a lot of these issues, primarily the mainstream media narrative. And um, here's another reason why the mental health issue is so central. And I know people will go, dang, he's bringing that mental health one back. This is a mental health situation. These under, people got to understand this. The NBA wanted me out of the way for a couple of reasons. One of them was because of what I represent, a black man who takes himself seriously, competent, will, look, will, will read the fine print, and will push back against the status quo. That, that represents a real threat to destabilize the status quo. So they wanted me gone for that reason. But secondly, they wanted me out of the way because the mental health conversation is the linchpin to their next phase and agenda, which is psychological warfare. Okay, we're in the fourth turn of society. And in the fourth turn, the most dangerous weapons aren't nu nuclear, the, the, the most dangerous weapons aren't nukes, it's social media. We're in a full blown information war. And this is something Bannon does a great job of articulating. He says there's three forms of war. There's biological warfare, there's informational warfare, and there's kinetic warfare, guns up warfare, right? And, and, and most of this agenda wants us to surrender before the fight ever begins. And these, this is why this, the, the anti-Second Amendment movement is so off base. They go, 
well, you know, in, in the face of a tyrannical government, if your government turns on you, good luck with your rifles. They got drones, they got planes, they got, you guys are cowards. So you're gonna give up the last fighting chance you have because you're over, you're, you know, because you're, <laughs> because the, the scales are tipped? Then you're not a fighter. You have no, you have no, you have no courage. You have no morals. You have no constitution. Yeah, we'd be outgunned if the United States government turned on its citizens, but we have the greatest advantage of all. We have the moral position and we have the numbers, right? And, and that's something that people don't understand. A lot of people don't understand, especially the left. Is and another thing they don't understand is a locked door is only as strong as the person with the key. I don't care how high tech they want to go and and drones and artificial intelligence and robots. There's always going to be a, have to be somebody who presses the button. There's always going to be a central command. And wherever that is, it's only as strong as the people with the key. And I don't think that a lot of these neoliberal leftists uh, could could hold court when the time comes to be pressed to give up that key. They're going to fold. They're willing to fold now. So, you know, I, I think that the Kyle Rittenhouse example that you're saying in the Waukesha thing is an example of this psychological warfare that, that the system and the establishment want to play. I think you make a great point. I think the North Vietnamese were outgunned. I think the people in Afghanistan were outgunned. Uh, <laughs> you, can, you can be outgunned, but if you ain't got a pair of balls, I mean, if the other side's got balls and you don't, you're going to lose. Uh, hey, Royce, this was fantastic. You're the smartest athlete I know. Uh, would love to have you back on again anytime you want to come on. Or I, I don't want to bother you too much, but I am going to ask you to come back on. Uh, and you're going to have to tell us no, because I just think we need to hear from you. You got a lot of important things to say. I, I think uh, people need to hear you. And uh, it sounds like Steve Bannon is doing great things with you. And uh, I wish him and you well. And you'll be hearing from us very soon, sooner than you probably would like, uh, <laughs> maybe as early as next week, ask you to come back on. But uh, hey, man, I'll be praying for you uh, and wishing you and your family good health and a happy Thanksgiving. Man, I appreciate it. I appreciate what you're doing, man, and thank you for allowing me to tell a little bit of my story and letting people understand a little bit more about who I am. The mainstream media has tried to hide me from the people. I do have the people's best interest at heart. Whether you agree with me or not, I'm open to, to people's thoughts about my ideas and, and trying to refine my ideas to better represent the people. Um, and, and I'm happy to be connected with a person like you, Jason, and, and keep going. I see a lot of people try to decry you and, and uh, you know, criticize you, but but you're on the right side of history, man, and you have the right moral position. So I, I appreciate it. And, and thank you to your audience. I, I want to correct great. you on one thing. One thing. Don't engage in the conversation about being on the right side of history. History is written by whoever wins it. And so that can change. What's really important and where we've gone away from is people used to judge themselves. Am I on the right side of God? Because that stuff yeah. in the Bible has been that's 2,000 years of collect collective wisdom and history. It, it, when you're trying to be on the right side of God, you'll tend to make the right decisions. Being on the right side of history means being on the right side of whoever's in power. And that changes with the win. Thank you so much. I hear tomorrow playing. Uh, happy Thanksgiving, everyone. You'll hear from me again on Monday.